tuned in to the Politics Podcast, your home for St. Louis politics. What's going on, St. Louis? It's your boy, Terry Wilson, and I'm back for another episode of the Politics Podcast. And as usual, we got another good guest joining in with us today. Be on the lookout for the August election. We got an August election coming up, August 3rd. Um, It's one thing on your ballot if you're in St. Louis County. It's the St. Louis Community College Proposition R. It's a simple majority required, and it's for the purposes of updating career training programs to enable job growth in critical industries, including healthcare, information technology, financial services, and other services that they provide at St. Louis Community College. So uh, make sure you all get some information on that. I'll be sure to post a website where you can get more information on that. Well, we got a great show today. I'm glad to be back. I had to take a week off, but you know, sometimes you just have to do that. So uh, we are joined today with a very, very special guest, a senator, a state senator from the 14th district. His name is Brian Williams. I'm going to bring him in so you all can see him. Let's see. All right. Let me see. All right. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Senator Brian Williams, how you doing today, man? You know, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. You know, um, they say uh, you've never been on an official podcast until you've been on the uh, on yours. So I'm excited for the conversation. Yes, sir, man. Hey, this is the hottest show in the loop, man. But, you know, uh, uh, unlike other shows, man, you know, I wanted to make sure I created a platform where we can actually have a voice on uh, the folks who who they kind of. Um, you know, roll over sometimes and, and we don't hear from them, man. I wanted to create a platform for the people right here down on the ground, something positive so we can hear the positive things that's going on. And of course, if some controversial things come up and the community needs to talk about it, we definitely will bring that here on the politics podcast, man. So that's what we're here for, man. And so I'm glad to have you here today, man. What's going on? You know, it's a lot. Um, you know, it is a whole lot. <laughs> you know, clearly, uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, um, doing everything I can to ensure that the St. Louis region is, is, um, you know, just reaching every, every, uh, level of potential it possibly can. Yeah. But I, I've spent the past several months in Jefferson city, uh, working, uh, in the, in the uh, Missouri Senate and, and, and really focusing on some, some really, um, strong, um, pieces of legislation that I'm so grateful and proud to have gotten across the finish line. And uh, a couple of weeks ago was, was signed uh, by the governor. Oh, definitely. We definitely go get into that conversation, man. Uh, but before we get started, man, the, f- the folks that might not know who Brian Williams is, man, you have a great, great, great story. Um, how you were getting your start in politics. And a lot of people think that Brian Williams just popped up on the scene, but Brian <laughs> Williams had a story before he uh, became senator. Um, I think everything that you were doing was preparing you for this moment, brother. And uh, one one thing I want to say before we get into it, man, I'm I'm proud of you and I'm proud of the work that you were able to do because, I mean, you literally hit the ground running, man. And so uh, tell our listening audience, man, how your political career actually got started and who is Brian Williams? I always give my guests uh, an opportunity to let everybody know who they are, but just kind of cover how your political career got started leading up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, just a kid that that grew up in Ferguson, uh, you know, to a single mom. Um, I was the oldest of three children, um, you know, and I and I was very fortunate to have a village uh, that, that really stepped in. My grandmother, who was the uh, first African-American woman uh, to get an international appointment as an auto worker. So uh-huh. my family was, you know, working class family, uh, really involved in the unions, really uh, my grandmother uh, advocated for women and people of color uh, to advance uh, in the workforce. She worked at Chrysler and retired from there. Uh, my mom, uh, same thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very humbling to be able to serve. I stayed in the Senate, you know, being somebody that, that, you know, that, that never really thought I would be doing what I'm doing today. 
uh, had an opportunity to uh, work in the United States Congress, uh, spent some time in Washington, D.C., uh, worked on anything from the tail end of the Benghazi hearings to regulatory things around um, banks, making sure that they're not uh, practicing predatory practices against uh, um, everyday families, um, ensuring that we're we're uh, maintaining a house population where folks are, are not being uh, put off their homes because they can't pay their mortgages. And then um, had an opportunity to come back to Missouri and oversee the rollout of the Affordable Care Act uh, marketplace under uh, President Obama's administration. And uh, basically, you know, that was something that was really important to me, Terry, because we we see during this pandemic, it's more important now that folks have access to quality health care, especially um, um, poor and, and underserved communities and people that are just um, underinsured. So uh, to be able to, to do that and then um, clearly after working in that capacity for uh, quite a few years, uh, I asked my mom and grandmother, was it OK to run for uh, state Senate? Mm -hmm. And um, they said it was OK. Uh, they supported me, uh, ran in a primary against uh, two really good people, uh, tremendous leaders uh, that were state representatives, was very fortunate to be successful uh, in that primary election. And that was in 2018. And uh, here we are three, almost three years later, two and a half years later, uh, I serve as the assistant um, Democratic floor leader in the Missouri Senate, um, have been able to focus on uh, a myriad of things, whether it's uh, um, advancing things around uh, police reform and police accountability, uh, criminal justice reform, ensuring that folks who may have made a mistake in their life have an opportunity to uh, be model citizens. And then most importantly, figuring out how do we uh, protect our seniors and give back to our youth, uh, being involved in the school districts, um, advocating for um, quality education, ensuring that we really take uh, every opportunity we can to ensure that communities like North St. Louis County thrive at the highest level possible. Absolutely, man. Well, it, it seems like you got the proper training uh, to be prepared to go up to Jeff City, man. And, you know, um, would you say all of those, so those various roles that you got an opportunity to work uh, in, uh, working for the congressman, would you say that kind of helped you um, build some of those meaningful relationships that you needed to be successful in your run for a uh, sin, especially with it being, you know, your first time running for a political office at the end of the day, winning elections is all about building relationships and creating coalitions. And I think, um, you know, you serving in that, in that capacity early on, would you say that that kind of helped, um, you know, people already be familiar with you when you're out there asking for your, for your vote? 100%. You know, um, even in the capacity that I was serving in, uh, working with uh, Congressman Clay, uh, I started as an intern. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was getting my my master's degree at Washington University, mm -hmm. did an internship. Uh, we didn't even know each other. And I just really worked uh, extremely hard to, to really get into a senior uh, position within his office. Uh, so that taught me a lot about constituent services, uh, mm -hmm. the importance of building relationships with local elected officials. And then really uh, just understanding the true just commitment of public service. I got to see firsthand that it's hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's really difficult serving the public because there are so many needs and there's so many uh, demands that our community um, just needs to, to be where it, where, where it should be and where it needs to be. So that was a very uh, big piece. But again, as you stated, the relationship building was so important for me because it was so many people that I worked with and I helped and support it, not from a position of politics, but really trying to help them uh, serve their community the best that they possibly could. Right. So I was grateful to be able to build a relationship where it wasn't about politics. It was about, hey, you know, if you call Brian Williams and, and, and it's an issue pertaining to the federal government or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. we knew that he was reliable and somebody we can count on. And then just as a person, you know, you and I have known each other for a very, very long time before either one of us knew what we would be doing today. Right. And, you know, I always took just great pride in just uh, treating people the way I wanted to be treated. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And, and, and before we get into the policy aspect, because I know you got some things that you're definitely proud of. Mm -hmm. um, but I want I want to stick to uh, the election real quick. Right. So this was your first run. 
but you have always campaigned, helping out elections. You, it was in your blood. Got the union background with the mom and the grandma. Yeah. Um, what did it feel like being on the side of elected versus, you know, not elected? Because you know, <laughs> before before I, before I became an elected official, you know, on the outside looking in, always helping, always helping with campaigns, various campaigns. It feels different when you're not the ultimate person responsible for everything. So yeah. now, now that you are uh, an elected official, what's the difference between when you're on that side versus being on this side? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's a pretty big difference. Your name on the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, even if, if somebody make a mistake, uh, or, or you know, something doesn't turn out the way you want it to do. To whether it's election night or or an issue that you're focusing on in your office, helping people in the community, all they know is that Senator Brian Williams screwed that up. Right. So that's that's one big difference. Yeah. Um. The the other difference is that you know, one thing I try to tell a lot of folks, especially um, folks younger than us that want to get into politics or policy or government. You know, it's 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 a very um, fulfilling, but but thankless job. Yeah. And a lot of people think that it's about you know being on on television or 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 you know people saying really nice things about you. It's really about doing the work. And and one thing that I learned once I was elected is that it was one thing I understood the importance and the needs of our community. But now I have to be able to take everything that I that I, I said I was capable of and actually put that into action. And it's people that really have that expectation for you because they they exercise their constitutional right to, to get you there yeah. or the people that didn't vote for you. They want to see whether or not you're worthy of, of getting their support in the future. Right. So, man, that was where the rubber hit the road for me. It was very, very different. But I, I think the one thing that that always really kind of kept me kept me um, in in the right space in terms of just doing the job was that I, I knew I was committed to doing the work, yeah. and I knew that I was I was committed to doing everything I could to ensure that our community, our region, and our state was in the best position it possibly could be. And then everything else was really just being a student to the process. Man, that, that, that is amazing, man. You know, I was having a conversation with one of the seniors. Um, actually, the apartment complex that you visited a few months ago um, right. in Jennings, and one of the seniors that I'm real close with, uh, Miss Lola, man, uh, she said something to the effect, because I told her I was interviewing you, because she followed me on social media. I told her I was interviewing you, and she said, you know, I really admire – Senator Brian Williams, because the same way he campaigned to get my vote is the same way he's governing as senator, man. And, you know, that really, really resonated. And she, you know, of course, she said, you know, he ain't better than you, but I love, <laughs> I love both of y'all. But, um, you know, and she and she made similar comments to me as well. But I really do believe, man, as a public servant, man. That work you put in to get elected, you need to do equal work once you get elected. That's just a prerequisite. Yeah, for for yeah, sure. that's just what's requ required. Yeah, to be able to serve, and and I think that's the problem is that a lot of people think that governing, campaigning is governing. Right. You know, um, I was I was very uh, fortunate to in a very short period of time to go to a super majority Republican legislature, yeah. be able to talk about some of the most pressing issues to the black community yeah. and be able to uh, engage and have a constructive dialogue with people from all over the state who would never understand the challenges of being a black man in America or being a black woman in society. Mm -hmm. You know, those are things that that we were very grateful to be able to do with a phenomenal staff uh, where we were able to pass one of the most comprehensive police reform bills uh, in, the, in the history of the state, where we're banning chokeholds, uh, we're making sure bad police officers are not coming to communities like Ferguson and Jennings and, and other communities where we've seen there's been a lack of, of trust between the community and the police. But we've also focused on another element. Um, how do we provide law enforcement with tools to be able to uh, effectively do their job when we all know that it's a high stress, difficult job. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, for example, uh, with Senate Bill 60 that I filed and passed into law, uh, we give police officers the discretion when it comes to executing a warrant a w arrest. So now if you're driving through uh, St. Louis County and you may have um, got a municipal violation, nothing serious, traffic, uh, you know, traffic violation, um, you know, something of that nature. A police officer now can say, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get that taken care of. You may be taking your kids to school. You may be going to work because you're trying to come up with the money to pay this fine. Right. right. But instead of taking them to jail and giving them more fines, we want police officers to, you know, give people a chance, you know, and, and allow them to make to write that um, that mistake other than just continuing to burden them with more um, with more debt and clearly um, their time with putting them in jail. And, you know, that was going to be my next question, man. So you were in a very difficult uh, position as a senator. First off, you were a black man. You were a Democrat. You were from St. Louis. Uh, and, and you're a Kappa. Um, so <laughs> but, but how were you able to navigate around all of that adversity, man, and come up with uh, this this bill it was SB 60 mm -hmm. and get across to actually get it across the fin to get anything across the finish line in Jeff City as a Democrat is hard in itself. But explain to the audience, man, how how you were able to to really get to really get that implemented and get it in place and get it to the governor's desk. I mean, in, in almost record time, too. Um, yeah. At the first year, I spent the year focusing on it. The first session we filed it, we passed it. So yeah, that that's very very unusual. Yeah, uh, very unusual. Um, so you know, th I think your listeners will find this pretty interesting. You know, because sometimes we just get to talking about just the the, the content of bills and things we did, which this right. is a very very big deal. Yeah. And I really encourage folks to to follow uh, me at www.senatorbrianwilliams.com and get updates because that, that's far more in depth than we would have time for today. But uh, this process is something I think a lot of people should hear about. Um, so last year, the governor called a special session. And uh, during that special session, he wanted to tackle violent crime in the city of St. Louis. And um, he proposed uh, removing the residency for St. Louis city police officers. He wanted to, um, expand a witness protection program and he wanted to start charging young people as 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 early or as young as the age of 12 as adults wow for committing violent crimes and i was strongly opposed to that which is no surprise but i asked the governor i said well if you want to take up these things in a special session how about we expand the call to take up police reform and we can start figuring out not only how we tackle violent crime, but how do we build the trust in the community to figure out who the bad actors are? Right. Because right now, folks in the community are afraid to talk to law enforcement because they're concerned that they may become victims in the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the governor decided that it was best to take it up in January during the regular session and not the special session. Uh, we ended up, um, the, leg the Senate and legislature, which I, I did not support, uh, ended up um, it's removing the residency requirement for the city of St. Louis, um, expanding the witness protection program and um, lowering the age for kids to be charged uh, as adults to 12. I came back in January after spending a year traveling around the entire state, talking to folks in Springfield, Missouri, Jefferson City, Columbia, Kansas City, St. Louis, of course, um, uh, Cape Girardeau, meeting with police chiefs, activists, advocates, ACLU, National Association of Social Workers, prosecutors, judges, uh, and and tried to and brought together a stakeholder group that we could say, hey, we need to have a serious conversation about how we move forward around uh, police reform, criminal justice reform, and policing as a whole. And the first question that they asked me was, well, Senator, what did you know about policing? And I said, well, I've never served in law enforcement, but what I do know is George Floyd could have easily been me. Absolutely. And 
I don't want what happened to George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or any other um, um, senseless death at the hands of law enforcement to happen here in the state of Missouri. I don't want to see the breakdown that happened between the police and, and the community um, that I grew up in uh, and represent now Ferguson to, to ever have to re I don't want residents in our community to ever have to relive that again. Right. So uh, we started working through the process uh, days of disagreement uh, agreements. And we finally got to a place where uh, we agreed on um, some very strong progressive police reforms that would make policing better, but would also work towards criminal justice reform areas to allow people to be able to re-enter back into society and then put really our criminal justice system in a place where it's fair and equitable. And it's just not sending people who are um, who are black or, or, or under um, or not privileged in a lot of ways to prison, potentially for crimes that they didn't even commit. Right. So um, we, we ended up filing a bill. I went to one of my Republican colleagues. They wanted to remove the residency in Kansas City, which I said, if you, I know you guys are going to focus on this police issue of removing the residency. If you guys move forward with this, which they can do that, being in the supermajority, right. I said, we need to move forward with my reform. So what we did was we wrote both bills together in a city, what's called a Senate committee substitute. Okay. And it basically would say, if my bill die, your bill die. If your bill, if, if your bill moves forward, my bill moves forward. And we basically locked it there. And um, we had to work through the process. We got so many different uh, people on board. Uh, I serve as the leader of the Black Caucus in the Missouri Senate. Um, all uh, Black um, state senators became co-sponsors. Um, we were able to uh, get um, provisions in that bill from members of the legislature that had been working on priorities towards criminal justice reform for four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. So it was people that were able to get priorities that had never been able to get done um, by uh, by uh, allowing uh, by us allowing them to put that as a as a provision within our bill, and then we ultimately got um, hands down one of the most comprehensive police reform bills across the finish line today before the last day of session, and and the governor signed it uh, three weeks ago. Wow, and, and you know, collaboration, man, is so important, man, and and. And the collaboration that happened on that bill, man, was amazing. Uh, just imagine if we get that same type of collaboration on well, more bills, man. If we no. got it just in general. And, and one thing I, I'll tell you, Terry, that we got to keep in mind is that with this bill, it's going to actually have an impact on people day one. We added a provision with the motion to vacate, which would now allow uh, our local prosecutors like Wesley Bell to provide significant evidence to the courts to uh, be able to have a case retried like Lamar Johnson, who's who has been in prison now for over two decades for a crime that he may not have committed. We've also added a provision which would take the age from 12 back to 18 for a young person to be tried as an adult. And they would not be allowed to be um, housed in a in a, an adult jail. They would be in juvenile detention with their peers. We've also, with this bill, was able to um, make sure that women who are in correctional facilities have access to um, feminine products, which they did not prior to this bill going into law for free. You know, it's so many different things that we were able to do with this bill that I'm so proud of. But again. Uh, to be able to do that in a super minority legislature, uh, if I was to, when I told people what we were focusing on and what my goal was with this, they said it was nothing short of impossible. And uh, to be able to get that across the finish line and have my name on the bill as a Democrat in the state of Missouri is by far a very humbling and, and rewarding experience. Man, that's amazing, man. We're going to take a quick break. And uh, we're going to come back. If you're just tuning in, we're having a conversation with Senator Brian Williams from the 14th District of the great state of Missouri. We'll be right back with the Politics Podcast. This is the Hip Hop Gardener from Blackberry Landscaping. And when I'm ever listening to an app or podcast shows, I'm listening to the hottest show in the loop, the Politics Podcast, your home for St. Louis politics. You better ask somebody. What up, St. Louis? This is committee man, Farrakhan Shigog. You're tuned into a politics podcast, your home for St. Louis politics. 
Hey, hey, it's your favorite ladybug, and you're tuned into the hottest show in the loo, the Politics Podcast, your home for St. Louis politics. You better ask somebody. You tuned in to the Politics Podcast, your home for St. Louis politics. <laughs> What's up, St. Louis? We are back. And if you're just tuning in, we're having a great conversation with my friend, my brother, the senator from the 14th District, Brian Williams. What's going on, Brian? Uh, Man, we're having a great conversation, man. I'm I'm really uh, enjoying how you're explaining the process uh, because this is the part that folks don't really hear about, man. And it's very important. And that's one of my goals I set out uh, when creating this platform, man, to really educate our people on what's going on uh, so people have understanding. You know, a lot of people, they'll see something that happened in the news with an elected official or a bill that passed or a law that passed, but they don't really have an understanding of how it got there. Or it's an issue right now that's not being taken care of and they're not understanding the process of how to fix those issues, man. And I appreciate uh, you explaining. And I appreciate all my past guests that have come on and, and did the same thing as well. So uh, we appreciate you. And I just want to remind everybody, you can check out the Politics Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Podbean. And you're tuned in right now live on Facebook and YouTube. I hope everybody's enjoying your Sunday. Uh, today. So, Brian, we were uh, having a discussion about how you were able to collaborate uh, on this uh, monumental bill and you got it uh, across the finish line. Um, let me ask you, let me ask you a question, man. You know, you, you've really hit the ground uh, running. And when I say you hit the ground running, man, you got up there and you wasn't playing no games, Brian. You got elected and, and you said, hey, I'm going to work. I'm going to work for the people of uh, not only the state of Missouri, but especially St. Louis, the St. Louis region. And uh, you, you've you been definitely proving yourself, man. And one thing I really like that you make sure you inform us of everything that's going on and everything that's about to come up. And speaking of that, uh, you and uh, Kevin Wyndham, uh, state rep Kevin Wyndham, you all just had a uh, town hall. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, we we had a town hall at uh, at uh, UMSL. Yeah, so the University kind of, of Missouri kind of St. Louis. Kind of talk about uh, what went on at the town hall and what was the purpose of the town hall and 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 did you think you got the point across and, and got some good feedback uh, at that town hall? Well, um, you know, I, I it was one first. Uh, I was grateful to have UMSL as a partner, and uh, clearly. Um, Representative Kevin Wyndham, who represents that part of the region within the Senate district, uh, coming and joining me. Uh, we gave them a legislative update and and we also uh, streamed it. So this can be, we'll make sure that we provide you with the information uh, to be able to look at it on YouTube for those who couldn't catch it. Uh, but we streamed it. We have folks that uh, attended, clearly socially distanced and, and wore masks. And um, we were talking about something that I think needs to be the, the, the sole conversation right now for our communities and our region and our state. Um, basically, you know, I grew up in North St. Louis County. You you grew up in North County. We, we see where uh, the communities that are always coming in last, the communities that are underserved when it comes to providing resources. North County, which is one of the largest populations of black people in the state, is always the last community to, to see uh, any type of investment. So what we want to do is we want to start investing in North County. And right now we are looking at the um, the uh, federal relief funding that has been um, appropriated to our state through the Biden administration. Um, the state of Missouri is going to receive in a sum, uh, already half of it, uh, $2 billion. St. Louis County is going to get $200 million, which they've gotten half already. And then the city of St. Louis is getting $517 million. There's no reason why we should not be talking about how do we revitalize North St. Louis city and county. And that's what we're focused on. Um, Right now, we discussed a potential opportunity which would create a funding model 
that we believe could be uh, tremendous for this region. Uh, it, it allows us to, to break out of our silos and fiefdoms and really start taking a regional approach to how we uh, provide resources and invest in our communities. So um, I'll be calling on uh, the municipalities as well as St. Louis County in the state to um, create a matching funds uh, mechanism to work towards infrastructure and capital improvement projects. And basically what this looks like, for example, uh, UMSL. UMSL is looking to consolidate its, its campus. So they're gonna be moving a lot of their students from the South Campus, which is South on Natural Bridge, Mm -hmm. to the north side, which is the northern side of Natural Bridge, to the main campus. That's about 40 acres that can be um, primed for development. We're talking about healthy foods, a grocery store, a healthcare facility. Um, it could be countless things there that we could um, have developed there to benefit North County, where folks do not have to leave their community to have access to quality things. Um, you know, this is something that can be huge for our community. And that's why we held the town hall to get community input to where we are really focused on some of the things that our neighbors think would be good and that they would like to see in their backyard. And it's not just right there in Normandy, we're looking at communities like Jennings where we'll be talking with Jennings mayor, uh, who's a phenomenal mayor um, and leader in this region. Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, the, the city of Ferguson and, and the mayor there and, and Delwood and so many different communities where we have so many great uh, municipal leaders that have um, that deserve uh, to not only have quality investment in their communities, but we need to have that commitment coming from multiple levels of government. And it needs to be uh, a lot more than we have ever invested before. And we need to make sure our communities are a lot stronger after the pandemic than it was prior to the pandemic even starting. Absolutely, man. And, you know, uh, regionalism is what we need to be focused on. Um, you know, a few years ago, we had this big ordeal about uh, mergers and all of this stuff. But I think once we figure out a way to come to the table to say, hey, how can we work together? Uh, because at the end of the day, if Jennings is doing well and Ferguson is not, then North County is not doing well. We need to make sure that everybody is doing well and we need to have those conversations. And I'm glad that you guys uh, provided that space to start the conversation because, you know, in the past, a lot of funding has come down, but there's never really been any conversation around it, any planning around it, any collaboration around it. And I'm glad that you are, uh, you know, taking the lead on uh, making sure that we start those types of conversations and, and of course, there's other folks having the conversations, but I, I think it's very important that we bring it all together at the table together to see how um, it all affects us and how we can all benefit from it. Um, because we we definitely don't want this money to be one of those one offs where we just throw some money at something. It definitely needs to be something uh, that is sustainable, something that that is changing, life changing for yep. our communities. You know, uh, we, we need to move past the one offs and the the one program here and the one program there. We need to invest in something that's uh, sustainable, man. And and I'm I'm glad to see, you know, organizations working with government, uh, such as the Urban League and Beyond Housing and other regional organizations that are that are coming together to help bring that change uh, that 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 you and I uh, want to see in our communities, man. So it requires partners, and and I think that's one thing folks have to understand. You know, um, my style of governing goes back to. Uh, one thing my grandmother always stressed to me, and she always made it clear that no one gets anywhere by themselves. Right. And we really need we need everyone, all hands on deck. Um, you know, everybody needs to be a part of this process to community, um, creating a, a, a group of stakeholders who understand what the challenges are in, in our community, especially the underserved parts of the community. And, and keep this in mind, Terry. You know, um, the Senate district that I represent, I, I have communities like Clayton and Ladue, uh, University City. And then I go through North County and take in Jennings and Pine Lawn and Ferguson, um, Hazelwood, Florissant, and go all the way to St. Charles County. So to, I'm very intentional about revitalizing North St. Louis, yeah, in particular North St. Louis County. Um, I don't, you know, I make it very clear to my constituents on the Southern uh, part of the district that we need to be all committed to um, addressing 
the most challenged areas. And right now, uh, North St. Louis should be getting um, full attention when it comes to how we spend this, um, I mean, just um, unprecedented amount of uh, federal funding. Absolutely. You know, I had conversations with my friends in St. Charles and and, and uh, South County. I got a lot of friends out, out that way. And I always tell them, I say, hey, if North County wins, we yeah. all win. You know, uh, you know, if we take care of North County, we all win, you know. Uh, so so uh, let's move aside from uh, policy a little bit. Okay. And um, so you're not considered a new senator anymore because you're up for re-election um, next year. Yeah, in, ter- in the world of term limits, I'm a senior state senator yeah. now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I've been a state senator now for two and a half years. Right. <laughs> so so what would you say now that you are a state senator and got your feet wet and been in some couple of uh brawls, uh political <laughs> brawls and had some wins, what would you say has been your biggest challenge uh since being a senator? Um I'll say probably the the biggest challenge is I think sometimes we underestimate just how much time goes into to doing the job. You know, uh, serving in the Missouri Senate is a part time job, but it's full time responsibility. Um, I have to go to Jefferson City uh, four to five days a week, um, more than half the year. I have to maintain um, um, a home in in two different places, clearly here in St. Louis and and then in Jefferson City. Um, You know, we work very long hours in the Missouri Senate. Sometimes we work uh, overnight until six, seven o'clock the next morning. Uh, so it's a very, very um, just draining and, and, and challenging job. And then you still have to be able to, to to be there for your family and still be able to do all the things that's required to yeah. survive as, as a person. Like, you know, I think sometimes, you know, folks view elected officials as kind of being uh, exempt from having to pay bills and, and having to, you know, take care of their, their kids and their family. And, you know, people get sick. You know, and we run into all of the same issues and challenges that the people we serve do. So I think that's probably one of the most interesting but challenging parts of the job. It's just really trying to make that just maintain that balance of like your your personal life and and still, um, you know, doing your job at the highest level possible. And I can tell you right now, any elected official that's exhausted and 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 ask themselves like how did i get myself into this situation i guarantee you those are the people that are serving their communities at a very very high level and and um you know it's, it's really good sometimes to see um you know the fruits of your labor and that and that ultimately where people or uh their their quality of lives are, are being um benefited and, and clearly enhanced man you're everywhere every time i look up brian williams is everywhere in the community, man. How do you prioritize where you go in your district? Like, like how do you, like, it's almost like you magical or something, man. Like, <laughs> like you got a clone or something, man. How, how, how do you actually prioritize, um, you know, your, your schedule and your activities um, within the district? Right. So that, there's two pieces that I think that needs to be acknowledged. One, Man, I have the best family in the world um, that's so supportive to me and that that really um, allow me to, to, to be the best leader I can. You know, whether it's, you know, my mom or my grandmother, it's just so many people that, that play an important role in my village that that help me keep things together at home. And, you know, and, and I can focus on just being a, a, a good leader. The other part is. You know, I have an amazing staff like um, my my scheduler, my executive assistant, like they ch- tremendous. I have a phenomenal chief of staff and they're very intentional about just things that they know are important to the region and the district, things our communities need, but also things that are important to me. So we they understand what I want uh, to focus on. So a lot of things, man, really, you know, I'm not I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to meet and, and mentor and talk to kids. I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to go and, and sit and hear from our seniors. And then I'm never going to take an, um, turn down an opportunity to be in the community with people and, and remind them that, 
is people that that represent them and they they care about them. So, you know, man, I think just that that drive is what really just kind of motivate me to really manage my time. And I enjoy doing it. But the other side, too, man, is like, don't you know, let's just be real about it. Man, I, I served with some really phenomenal people. You know, I go to Jennings and uh, Mayor Austin and even you, uh, Councilman, y'all like y'all, y'all support me in a way where that makes my job so much easier. So to have so many people, um, you know, who who supported me uh, initially and, and then now see that I'm doing the work and support me now um, to be there for me and, and want me to be in their spaces and let me know what's happening in their communities. Man, that's probably the priceless part. Like, like you know, I, I think a lot of people look at politics and they see how divisive it is. Yeah. But man, when I tell you working together is so much more powerful than working by yourself. And, you know, when I move on and, and do something different, you know, I, I want to move on and do something different with some friends. Absolutely. And the only way that happens is by, you know, being there for your community and, and really supporting other leaders the way you want them to support you. Absolutely. Man, it's, it's one question that I ask everybody to come on the show, man. So you got to get asked the question, too. Oh, OK. <laughs> I, I want to see if you answer it right. Because, <laughs> so, I'm gonna try. so out of all my guests, I think I think 60 percent of my guests answered it exactly how I asked. So I'm going to make sure I'm clear because I'm like, maybe I'm not asking it right. But I always get a comment in the comments for the shows like they didn't answer that right. So we we gonna uh, we gonna see if uh, Senator uh, answers the question right. And the question that I have is: in five words, in five words, what does good governance look like? In five words, um, what good governance looks like, um, I would say. Um, consistent, reliable transparent um unwavering and i'll probably say the fifth one is thoughtful wow hey senator you did it <laughs> Hey, like I, t like I told the other guests, I said, I ain't asked for an explanation. I said in five words, what does good governance look like? And uh, your last one was thoughtful. And I could tell you're very thoughtful with your answers, man. And uh, it's, important. it's so important. I appreciate that, man. You, you definitely uh, answered it, man. So, man, I have really enjoyed uh, you coming on the show, man. And I hope this isn't the last time. But if you have some final words for uh, the politics podcast audience, this is your time to end it off and uh, make sure you let everybody know where they can find you as well. So we're going to give you the last few minutes to end us off, man. And we, we appreciate you coming in. Hey, absolutely. One, I want to say thank you again for having me. And, and thanks again, sincerely, for your friendship. Um, you know, I think right now. The only thing I really want folks to, to know is that it's times that our community, our state and our country seem just deeply divided, especially after watching cable news 24 seven. You know, it's it's but I truly believe there's more that really unites our, our community and our state than divide us. So, you know, when you're talking about um, revamping our communities, uh, protecting black lives, access to quality health care, uh, things like criminal justice reform. Uh, ensuring that our, our, our unhoused population have a quality and affordable housing. Those shouldn't be partisan positions. They truly should be common goals that we all share. So, you know, I'm very grateful to serve this great state and this community in the Missouri Senate. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of uh, the things we've been able to do. And, and I'm looking forward to, to us all coming together and, and getting more things done in the future. Well, Brian Williams, Senator Brian Williams, man, we appreciate you tuning in man how can everybody find you on social media and websites and all of that stuff where can Absolutely. they find you at Is it everything brian williams everything brian williams but no uh i can be reached at my website www.senatorbrianwilliams.com again that's www.senatorbrianwilliams.com all one word 
Uh, you can go there. Please sign up so you can get updates and we'll keep you posted on what's happening in the community, what's happening in the legislature. I can also be found on Facebook, Brian Williams, uh, Brian Williams from Missouri. And then um, on Twitter, uh, this uh, Brian Williams M.O. And that M.O. is from Missouri. Well, there, there you go, folks. We got another show in the books. Another good guest that hopped on. I know he's going to be back. Election time is coming up next year. It came back so fast. Um, but he, he's a he's a great friend of mine, whether he's running for office or not. He's always welcome on the Politics Podcast, the hottest show in the loo. Uh, make sure you check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, YouTube, Facebook, you can catch us everywhere. So it's no excuse to not find the Politics Podcast. And uh, we'll see you on next Sunday. Peace.